Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest webinar within our Educator Workforce webinar series. This webinar is on EVOS, which is a value added student growth reporting system uh, that uh, uses state assessment data uh, and provides state assessment student growth data uh, that may be used for multiple purposes, but um, for the purpose of this discussion, uh, primarily we will be focused on the use of uh, state assessment student growth within educator evaluations. Um, thank you so much for uh, connecting with us today. Um, if you have called in to this webinar, please make sure to mute your phone so we do not pick up any ambient noise and sidebar conversations. So again, please, if you have called in, please mute your phone. Um, I have the, my name is Brian Lloyd. I am an education research consultant for the Michigan Department of Education in the Office of uh, Educator Excellence. Uh, uh, I do quite a bit of work around um, providing guidance for the measurement of student growth uh, within educator evaluations. Uh, I have the great fortune uh, today of being able to introduce our presenters. Uh, Deneen Deaton is going to be the primary presenter. Uh, Deneen uh, works for the vendor that provides EVOS to Michigan districts across the state. Um, Deneen is, uh, is a former educator uh, and uh, understands the perspectives of educators and how to explain complex topics to teachers uh, be, having been one herself. Uh, she also has a, a great amount of technical knowledge. Uh, she came to Michigan Department of Education and provided the training to, uh, to some stakeholders and to, uh, to the department. And she did an excellent job and I'm sure we'll do an excellent job again today. Uh, also uh, on the webinar for with us today is uh, when, Wendy, uh, uh, hold on, uh, Staskowitz, sorry about that. Wendy Staskowitz, uh, she is also a EVOS trainer and is also very, very knowledgeable uh, about EVOS and she will be uh, providing answers within our Q&A uh, along with uh, Joe Priest, an education research consultant, an education consultant for MDE uh, who has a lot of expertise in um, ed educator evaluations. Uh, so uh, thank you again, everyone, for attending. And um, uh, Deneen, I'll let you take it away. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, I, as we go through the, the slides and the demonstration of the, the application today, I want you to feel free to please stop me at any point and ask questions verbally. Uh, as Brian was saying, I'm a teacher from a long way back and I know that the learning needs of students is way more important than me uh, delivering a polished presentation. So please make sure to, to chime in at any point in time uh, with, with your needs as uh, attendees. So today we're just going to do an introductory um, overview of, the, of EVOS, which is a web application, uh, which is something that educators across Michigan can utilize as a growth tool like Brian was explaining. So I'm just going to start with the very, very basic. So what is EVOS? Well, first of all, it's a web-based application that you access online. I will be doing a demonstration again shortly to show you what that actually looks like. Uh, in addition, what is EVOS? It's about academic growth. It's actually about relative growth. And what I mean by relative growth is the idea that um, you are being compared in this model with, um, sorry about that, you're being compared in this model uh, to the, the state average. How are students growing relative to other students across Michigan who took the same test in the same year? So why might that be important? because your kids are, are going to college and going out for jobs out in the workforce, and they need to make sure that they are competitive when they're seeking out scholarships or college entrance or even going just for the job in your communities. They need to make sure that they're keeping pace with, with other students and schools across the state and, and able to grow in the same way that uh, others are as well uh, on the state assessments. 
So where does the data come from? I want to make sure that we're really clear about that. The first piece of the puzzle is the fact that educators across Michigan are doing a really good job of providing instruction for high school students, middle school students, and so forth. So we either have a year or semester of instruction that takes place. And then at the end of that, students take those standardized assessments, the Michigan uh, assessments, the MSTEP. Then Michigan, uh, Brian and his team, send the data to EVOS, and we uh, take that uh, information and run it through some very rigorous statistical analysis, and we provide reporting for you on the web. So EVOS is just one part of the picture. It tells us what happened according to standardized growth. Then your no local knowledge and expertise provides a why so that we can have insights into educational programs. When I'm looking at EVOS, I look at it very much from a, um, an educator perspective, and I like to call them actionable nuggets of information. I'm looking for information there that I can do something about uh, because data that's just flat and is not actionable is very little use to me. So I want to have some data that I can do something with to make changes for kids. So EVOS tells you what happened. Your local knowledge and expertise bring the why because you know about your local resources. And then both of those together can help provide insights into your educational program. So this is a, a scatter plot that I want to share with you today. And if you look at the x-axis across the bottom, you'll notice that we have the percent of tested economically disadvantaged students here that go from 0% of the students are tested economically disadvantaged all the way up to 100% of the students who are tested were economically disadvantaged. And then on the y-axis, we've got entering achievement. This is actually a scatter plot from another client that we have. This is a scatter plot out of Tennessee. And we're able to show you this scatter plot here because Tennessee makes these available publicly. So it's just something you could actually go on their side and see yourself. Um, but what you're seeing here when we're talking about entering achievement and the percent of students who are tested economically disadvantaged is there is a, a stark relationship here. This downward trend here is something that we've known about in education for a long time. Here we have students who, uh, the percent of students who tested economically disadvantaged was very low, and we notice that their achievement is relatively high. And the further we go across the scale, the more students that are economically disadvantaged, the lower they're entering achievement. This is called the achievement gap. It's been researched and researched for, for decades, and it still exists in the data today. I'm going to leave everything on this scatter plot relatively the same, except I'm going to change the y-axis from entering achievement to growth. I would like you to watch what happens to that relationship or correlation. Notice that that downward trend, that definitive relationship with, the, with that we saw, actually kind of disappeared. We still have the percent of students at a school that tested that were economically disadvantaged, but now we're looking at the growth of students at schools. So zero across the center of this graph represents the growth standard. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But zero doesn't mean no growth. It actually means average growth across the state for a particular uh, assessment for that year. Let's just say sixth grade math. And you can see that there were some schools that have very few tested economically disadvantaged students that had greater than average growth. And then we had some schools that had very few tested economically disadvantaged students who actually uh, didn't grow quite as much as the growth standard nor as other schools around the state. The same can be said for schools that are steeped in poverty where most of the kids are economically disadvantaged. We have schools that are doing a really great job of helping students to grow uh, greater than the state average and then some schools that are losing ground. So what the difference is between these two is that the, the prior graph is talking about growth versus achievement and that we have an achievement gap. You cannot control the students who are coming into your classroom and into your schools. You can only teach the ones that come through the door. This graph is telling us that we need to make sure that we're teaching all students equitably and helping them all to grow as much as we possibly can, no matter if they come from uh, homes that are not economically disadvantaged or homes that are almost all economically disadvantaged. So EBOS is about growth. So I want to talk about the difference between growth and proficiency for just a moment. So student proficiency basically answers the question, 
Did the students who took this test reach uh, the Michigan targeted proficiency level by the end of the school year? You can pretty much answer that yes or, or no. I've got, or you can answer it with a percentage. Yeah, half of my kids passed the assessment and half did not. Student growth, on the other hand, is a little bit different. It answers the question, did the students grow at the same rate in comparison to other students across the state who took the same assessment in the same year based on where they started and they ended the school year? We want students to keep pace with their peers from year to year to year as they go through their educational journey. So we talked just a second ago about the fact that this was a relative growth. What I mean by relative is the fact that it is in comparison to other students who took the same test in the same year. So we're going to go through a couple of models that you're going to see in the demonstration in just a few moments. EVOS uses two statistical models to analyze the data. The first is called the GAIN model. The report at the top is representative of the GAIN model. This uh, is an example of a GAIN model report, a value added GAIN model report for tests that are administered in consecutive grades, such as reading in fourth through eighth grade. The students take this test year after year after year. The bottom is an example of the predictive model. Uh, you'll see the reports that look like this where the, the measures are actually stacked up one on top of the other. And in this particular case, these are for tests that are administered in non-consecutive grades. Uh, they, they look a little bit different, but they both are, are reports that represent the amount of growth that students are, are experiencing in a school or in a program. The top one, the GAIN model, uh, the numbers that you see in these cells are represented uh, of NCEs, or normal curve equivalents. And we can talk more about that in, in training a little bit later as an overview. Just know that you might want to jot down normal curve equivalents. You can Google that a little bit later. And then the predictive model is actually the scale scores, the scaling unit of the test, or scale scores in Michigan. So with that said, let's talk about the colors that you'll see on the report. If you look back here, you saw some cells that were yellow, some green, some blue. So I want to explain the colors that you're seeing on the report before we actually go out and take a look at the report. So the question that those colors are answering is, on average, did the students who took this test this year, did they outpace the growth standard of that zero? Did they maintain or did they fall behind? So let's look at those colors and understand what they mean. So if you see that green color on a value added report, that means that students maintained. They kept pace with other students across the state who took that same test in the same year. When you get up into the blues, the light blue and the dark blue, it means that students actually outpaced the growth standard. They made more growth than the students across than other students across the state. They made more growth than the growth standard. The light blue means that we have moderate evidence in the testing data that tells us that students uh, there was a change in this school or in this classroom. And then we have the dark blue color that uh, represents significant evidence. There was a lot of information in the data that says these students did something differently. On the opposite side of the green color, the yellow color means that students kind of fell behind the growth standard. They did not keep pace with other students who took the test that year. Or they fell behind, uh, again, is represented by this light red or this pink color. The yellow means that we have moderate evidence that something different happened in this school or classroom and students fell behind. And the pink represents significant evidence that the data tells us very firmly that there was something different that happened in this classroom when compared to the growth standard or the state average. Of course, we would want to be able to find out as far as an actionable nugget goes, we would want to find out what's happening in the schools or the classrooms that are up here in this green and blue area so that we could find out those best practices because I'm certain that they exist across Michigan and see if we could replicate those practices. And then when we're getting down here into the yellow or the pink, what's happening in those schools uh, so that we could potentially provide some support, some professional development, or just some um, basic investigation of why, is, why are things happening in that way. So we talked about the fact that it's based on where students begin at the start of the year and where they end at the end of the year. So here we have a group of students. We like to call this little girl Helga. At the start of the year, 
Uh, the EVOS growth measures are based on a group of students, never on an individual. And if these students actually, on average, grew or outpaced based on the growth standard, that's when you would see that dark blue color. And then if uh, after, from the start of the year to the end of the year, if students actually lost ground, then you would say that they actually fell behind. They did not maintain their position in the state distribution based on where they started and they ended the school year. So at this point, I wanted to pause for a moment to see if you had any question about some of those basics for EVOS. And I want to navigate over to a, um, a website so that I can show you uh, what the modeling looks like uh, in practice on the website. So give me a second to share my screen if you have any questions. Please feel free to enter those in the Q&A chat box, and Wendy will help with answering some of those. And I'm going to share. So I want to make sure that you can see some recording that's on the screen. So this is an example of reporting, but the very first thing I want to do is actually show you what this looks like when you log in in Michigan. So give me just a moment to log out. Um, Michigan is going to have their very own login page. It's at mi.sas.com. So this is what your login page looks like. I want to make it just a tiny bit bigger to show you a few things. There is a Contact Us link in the upper right-hand corner, which would give you access to obtaining some additional help. We have a tech support team here in Cary. Um, that can answer your questions. We also have some resources that are available on your screen for understanding EVOS, using EVOS, some success stories that have occurred in other states, and also uh, some publications if you wanted to find out more in-depth information regarding, regarding the, um, the modeling that is occurring. So give me one moment. It looks like that there is some interference on the screen, so I want to make sure that you are uh, able to see it. Does that make that any better? Well, let's try sharing again. And let's move it over here, and I'll share again. One second, please. How's that? Still there. I'm not quite sure why that's there. Brian, any ideas on how to get rid of those boxes that we're seeing? I'm not completely sure, but uh, it's a small rectangle, uh, and uh, I think the uh, attendees will be will still be able to see uh, what they need to be okay. able to see. We can just we can just work around it. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So there are lots of resources here. If you want more information about uh, the facets of EBOS, there's a video on what is EBOS, some frequently asked questions. Uh, what's new from the 17, uh, from the 16 reporting to the 17 reporting. And uh, again, the success stories will help you to know how other states are using the modeling as well. So from here, I'm actually going to navigate to a demonstration um, server and log in um, to a generic site so that I can share the modeling with you, the reporting with you and the modeling with you. Earlier we talked about the fact that you'll see a value-added uh, report. This is what that actually looks like. Let's share again and make sure that we're sharing the screen. Here we go. Let's try that again. So this is a value-added report that we're going to examine uh, one of these uh, to start with, uh, but I want to show you the navigation tools. When you log into EVOS, you're going to have a blue bar across the top that is going to uh, enable you to navigate through the report. You have the reports drop down that is going to give you some report groupings. In Michigan, you're going to see the school report grouping, the district report grouping, the student report, and the comparison report. 
And for those of you that actually opted into the Data Hub, if some of you did, you'll actually see the teacher reports here as well. You can also, uh, if you are a district administrator, you will have the option of looking at the, the district report. And if you're a state user, you would actually be able to navigate from district to district. You can also take a look at the various tests. You'll have the, the MSTEP assessments for reading, math, social studies, and science in your reporting. Uh, you'll also have some information about uh, projections for uh, some of the college readiness uh, assessments. You will not have any of the high school assessments there. Remember that this is a demonstration site. We're just showing you how the actual reporting actually uh, works here. You're able to print reports. They will print for you as a PDF. You can also export the data. You'll be able to export student projections, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And then uh, the help feature here is also uh, very useful and very self-explanatory. When you look at it, it's very easy to read. The Contact Us link is at the top. Again, if you ever have any questions about the reporting, uh, always uh, click Contact Us, and we are able to provide some assistance for you there. So right now, I'm going to navigate first and foremost to a school value-added report. This is uh, under the Reports tab under School Reports for Value Added, and I'm going to go to a middle school called Akita Middle School. So let's take a look. This is for math. So this is one of those tests that is administered in consecutive grades. So we're talking about the game model. I'm going to scroll down so that you can see the entire screen. So this report is available at both the district and the school level. You'll have that legend at the bottom. Remember, these are not Michigan colors, but just our demonstration colors for today. But that language that I was using earlier about uh, the green in the middle means that students made progress similar to the growth standard. Then we had moderate and significant evidence that they made more progress. And then the pink and the yellow in Michigan would be that they made less progress than the growth standard. The bottom of this report is around the idea of achievement. What was the students who took this test at the end of this year, what was their average achievement? Uh, what best represents their average achievement at the end of that year? The state average for a particular assessment is always going to be at the 50th state percentile or the 50th state NCE. And then we can look straight down the page to see how our sixth graders and our seventh graders are performing relative to the state average year after year after year. It enables us to look at how our teachers are doing with meeting the needs of our incoming and outgoing students. You can follow this uh, vertically. And another way to look at this is actually diagonally. So we had a group of students. Again, this is demonstration data. We've not even reached 2110 yet. But we had students who ended sixth grade at the 56 NCE. The following year, they lost a little bit of ground, and they were at the 54th NCE. And then they bounced back a little bit to the 55th NCE by the time they ended eighth grade. So this, again, is just a representation of where students fell relative to achievement in comparison to the state average. At the top, though, is where we're going to be talking about growth. If you remember, we were talking about zero representing the growth standard. You can see all the way across that top row, zero represents the growth standard. That doesn't mean no growth, of course. That means average growth for the state. So how did these teachers and students in this particular school for math perform relative to others who took the test across the state in that particular year? Did they maintain, outpace, or did they fall behind? And what you're looking for when you look at these uh, values is you're looking for trends. So remember, the blues mean that they outpaced, and those pinks and reds means they fell behind, and green means that they maintained. So if I look at the sixth grade measures from 2110 to 2111 to 2112, I'm actually seeing a declining trend in sixth grade. This might be one of those actionable nuggets that we could do something about. But your local knowledge and expertise would have to bring the information to the table to say, I wonder why we had this declining trend. On the inverse, if you look at the eighth grade, we actually have an improving trend. A few years back in 2110, we actually uh, lost a little bit of ground. And then in the most two recent years, we've actually improved in the eighth grade practices. So you can read this vertically. You can also read it horizontally. 
how did we do with our math program for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade from one year compared to the next? So here we can see we were that dark blue, significant evidence that students were outpacing the growth standard in both 6th and 8th grade. But then the following year, something happened, and we have a declining trend here from significant evidence to just maintaining and from significant evidence to actually losing ground. It makes me wonder what actually happened at this school. And again, this is just a pretend school. Akita Middle School doesn't actually exist. Uh, so I would want to investigate what did we have a change in programs, a change in teachers? Uh, what could have happened that could have caused this decline in growth or this improvement in growth? Again, this is the gain model. It's very easy to read with, with regards to the colors. Uh, you can read it vertically, horizontally. You can also read it diagonally. How are we doing with growing students in comparison to other students across the state from year to year to year? Here, our students were outpacing. We had moderate evidence that they were outpacing. The following year, they had a slight decline, and the next year, they maintained. So this particular report, again, is the gain model. If I want to go look at the predictive model, I need to go up to the test and subjects and change to an assessment that is administered in a non-consecutive year. So maybe that would be science or social studies. So let's take a look at social studies for Akita Middle School. Let me blow this up a little bit for you so that it's a little bit more visible for you to see. The colors mean exactly the same thing, so I won't go through the legend again. But this is, a, is an example of a social studies assessment that is only administered at 8th grade. It's not administered at 6, 7, and 8. It's just administered in 8 as a single point. So with that, I want to draw your attention to 2112. The year of 2112, we had 364 students who were used in the analysis for 8th grade social studies. Uh, growth measures. I draw your attention to the number because these were the students who were used in the analysis because we actually require um, students to have at least three prior test scores in any grade and subject so that we can generate an expected or predicted score for them. So these 364 students <coughs> were expected to score a 756.9 based on their prior testing history. How have they done with assessments in years past? Based on that information, we can generate an expected score for them. When they actually sat in the seat and actually took the test, these 364 students actually scored a 758.7. They actually did better than we were expected to score. <laughs> Deneen, could you uh, reshare your screen? Oh, thank you. There we go. So, in this particular case, the students were expected to score, these 364 kids were expected to score a 756. When they actually scored a 758, they did better than expected. So, we can actually do a uh, comparison of the values and the difference of the function of these two numbers can give us a growth measure. So for social studies at eighth grade, year after year after year, remember these are different students each and every year because students only take this once. Uh, this is a program that is doing really well with helping students to grow. Uh, we also provide you the average predicted percentile and then the actual percentile for where they were supposed to fall in the state distribution. For this particular year, we expected them to score at about the 59th state percentile, and they actually, when they actually took the test, scored at the 60th. So again, this is, again, a growth measure that you see here for the predictive model for those tests that are administered in non-consecutive grades. I want to pause and ask Wendy or Brian if there are any particular questions that we need to answer. Well, I, I believe, um, Wendy, you, you may be maximizing the Q&A screen. Uh, which is covering up the presentation screen. So we may want to keep that Q&A screen the size that it is. Um, we've, at, we've gotten a few questions about uh, when the data will be available. And uh, we do expect the teacher level 
uh, student growth data um, that four districts that have opted in uh, to my data uh, through my data hub uh, to be available in early March. That's when we're estimating that is going to be available. Uh, we did get a question about uh, the PowerPoint being available after uh, after the session to um, to attendees. Um, and uh, I'm not sure, is SAS planning on making that available? I'm happy to make that available for you, Brian. I think that's all the questions that we've had so far, um, but uh, we're also answering the questions during the session as you're talking. Okay. I'm I'm going to read a question out loud that I think would be easier to answer um, that Deneen could just speak about. The question is, uh, do the reports take into consideration where like peers started and ended, and if the students who are like outpaced were the same or fell below the average growth of other students that year? Uh, for example, uh, economically disadvantaged students, English learners, and special education students. So thank you for the question. Uh, it's an excellent question. So when we're talking about uh, like students and so forth, that is not part of the modeling. These 364 kids in this particular analysis and this report are all of the students at this particular school uh, who uh, took the social studies assessment that year who also had that prior testing history so that we could uh, accurately represent uh, average predicted score for them. Some of these students are probably uh, special education students, maybe some are English learners, maybe some are academically gifted, others are just the average. But this is how these students who went through this program, all students, uh, performed on average. So this is their average predicted score compared to their uh, average actual score. Some of these average actual scores were really high, some of them were really low. But when it comes to the predicted score for this particular assessment, we wouldn't expect somebody like, uh, we use a, a, a name, Ethan, who is a student uh, in one of our slides that says that Ethan has always struggled in school. Our expected scores are based on how Ethan has performed in the past. And if he has always struggled, I would estimate that his uh, prior testing history uh, is going to show us that his scores are relatively low. We would utilize that in conjunction with all of the data that we have to generate a reasonable expected score for Ethan, which also would probably be a lower score, versus another student who has always done really, really well in their assessment history. We actually would generate an expected score for them based on their own testing history as well. Uh, they, each student kind of serves as their own control group, but when we actually do the modeling, all students come together to make this specific group. I'm going to go to another report at, uh, next that's, that I can actually show you some of the subgroup analysis that you were mentioning, but it's in a different report called a uh, diagnostic report. So let's go back for the moment to our math, and let's go to seventh grade and drill into the value-added report and go to a report which is called a diagnostic report. So on this report, we're just looking at seventh grade math. And this is a report that I used to use as an instructional coach or with uh, my administrative uh, school improvement team to analyze our programs across grades and subjects. So this diagnostic report, the blue bar represents the students who were in our program in the most recent year or last year. This gold bar represents up to three years of a prior, uh, prior data. The zero represents the exact same thing, the growth standard. So when the bars are going up, as it is here in the center, students made better than average progress. Bars that are going down, students are making less than average progress. And when they're hugging right here on the line, that means that they made relatively, uh, growth relatively similar to the growth standard. So these students are divided into these five groups based on where they would profile in the state distribution. So these are students who would profile at the bottom 20% of the state, so these are our lowest performing students. And what happened when you're looking at this particular report, we had students who were low performing, and in the most recent year, we lost additional ground with them. So low achieving students actually fell behind. Here, for average achieving students, they actually gained ground. They made better than average progress. 
So this is an area to celebrate right here where kids are making better than average progress. And then these others are places where we might want to focus some additional resources or strategies for instructional improvement. So with that said, let's go look at a subgroup analysis. The subgroups that I have here on this particular um, screen, remember this is demonstration data. You may not have all of these demographic features in, in Michigan that would be the ones that were provided by the state. But let's just look at seventh grade math for how we did with our economically disadvantaged students and click submit. Here we're able to look and see it's not very different uh, from the rest of uh, the, the entire group because it pretty much mirrors our, our program, the diagnostic report we saw before that. But what about with math? How would we do with looking at females in comparison to males maybe? you can actually dig through the report and take a peek and see what's different or what's the same. Um, it's really interesting to do, particularly with uh, high school, um, when you're looking at um, something like English or maybe even eighth grade reading and looking at the difference between males and females there. These particular reports, I think, are very useful for having instructional conversations with teachers. These do not have the statistical rigor that the value-added reports have because the value-added reports use all of the data that we have on a particular student, but they're still really good for having uh, some really uh, firm instructional conversations with teachers. These five groups are also available in a pie chart. I'm going to take a peek at that for just a moment. These colors still mean the same thing. We fell behind with our lowest kids. We were outpacing with our next to the lowest kids, our average kids, and then we fell behind with our above average and our highest achieving kids. The reason I wanted to show you this pie chart is because the diagnostic report is available both in bars and pies. So we're going to look at the next report called a decision dashboard. For this particular school, the decision dashboard at Akita Middle School my personal preference is to go to the center of the screen and change it instead of looking by test and grade to look by subject. This is a particular report that I always encourage superintendents to use with their principals. Um, I think it's important that you're able, principals are, uh, superintendents, excuse me, are very busy folks and they don't have time to go necessarily from report to report to report. But this is giving you that bird's eye view across the entire school. So at Akita Middle School, if the principal were sitting with the superintendent and you pulled up the decision dashboard, tell me how things are going with your mathematics program at your school. You have a row that tells you the value-added color for the most recent year and the three-year average. And then you have the diagnostic pies that we just looked at for those five groups of students with this being the lowest achieving students, the next to the low, our average achieving students, above average, and our highest achieving students. So if you notice, I'm going to mouse over that one again. These are our students who are performing in the lowest 20% of the state distribution. And if you take a peek across all of math at this particular school, I see a trend. We're losing ground with our lowest achieving kids, not just at one grade level, but all three grade levels, and even with algebra in this particular case with this sample data. To me, that's an actionable nugget of information. We need to find ways to help our teachers better support our lowest achieving students in math. When you look at it in terms of reading, again, our lowest achieving students at sixth grade and seventh grade are doing pretty well. They're actually outpacing the state growth standard. But in eighth grade, we're still losing ground with them. And look what a big proportion of the student population that actually is. So maybe our eighth grade teachers need help with supporting struggling readers. This is a, a dynamic report, uh, again, to look at, to explore, and see what are the trends that are happening at this school across all grades and subjects uh, for uh, the instruction. This pie represents the most recent year. Uh, there isn't a pie for the three-year average, but it at least gives you an idea that our three-year average, where we are, uh, have significant evidence that we're outpacing, but in our most recent year, we had a change. So the, diagnostic, the decision dashboard is one of those things that I, I really enjoy using. The final thing that I want to show you today, I want to go back to a diagnostic report for a moment. We'll go back to math. We'll go to seventh grade. 
And these uh, achievement groups over here, one representing the students here and two representing the students here and so forth, these are uh, the students that are in each of these particular groups. Remember that these are not real students. This is demonstration data, but you can actually see those students there. The other beautiful thing about the EVOS reporting is that you can get something called a student projection. This is how students have done in the past. But let's go look at, uh, let's take a look at uh, Alex Barnett here. And this is going to give us a student history report for Alex. This is how Alex has done on all of the prior assessments uh, across for math from the time he started school until the most recent year. So based on Alex's testing history, Alex is represented by the red line, the school is represented by the green line, and then the district by the blue line. Based on Alex's prior testing history, remember he serves as his own control group, we can go up to the student report tab that exists now and ask for a student projection. Then we can say, how is Alex likely to do on eighth grade social studies? He's not even taken that assessment yet, but how is he likely to do? given an average schooling experience. And in this particular case, Alex is a pretty uh, smart kid. He's expected to score at about the 84th state percentile. He has a 99.9% .9 probability of reaching a basic performance level, 97% likely to reach a proficiency performance level, and 72% chance that he's going to reach advanced. These would be the performance levels in Michigan. These are just the ones on our demonstration site. But what this tells me, again, I have another actionable nugget of information as a teacher. If I want to help Alex to grow as a social studies student, I'm going to have to do something to challenge him because he's already going to be basic, likely proficient when he walks in my classroom before the, the year even starts. If I want Alex to reach that advanced state, then I'm going to have to uh, ramp up the rigor and the challenge for him to make this course interesting and uh, a growth opportunity for him. So this is a projection for an individual student. We can get many projections uh, available. Uh, this is, again, our demonstration site. These would be projections that would be available for assessments in Michigan. Schools and districts can also get projections in something called a projection summary. I'm going to get a projection summary for seventh grade. Let's just get math. What is the likelihood our students are going to be proficient? And in this particular case, which is not a really good example, let's try six and see if we can get a good example there. Not one either. But the deal is here. We have greater than a 70% chance of reaching uh, proficiency in math. We have zero students there. Uh, we have between a 50 and 70 percent chance of reaching uh, uh, proficiency with this group of students, and less than a 50 percent chance of reaching um, proficiency with this group of students. Typically, the pie in your data, rather than demonstration data, is going to have this broken out into all of these different sections uh, that could show you. You can also uh, look at this by your subgroups as well. This can help administrators with school planning. Uh, in planning for upcoming years when you know that you have a large group of students who are going to require challenge or another group of students who might actually require some extension of the curriculum or uh, remediation to help them to accomplish the goals. So a final report that I want to show you here before I flip over and show you the teacher reports are the scatter plots. These are going to be available in your uh, comparison report. I'm going to go take a look at ma a math scatter plot for the most recent year of 21-12. And I'm going to go down and throw all of the schools in our school district on the screen. So each dot represented in the scatter plot here is for um, a school in our district who teaches sixth grade math. You can go up to the top and change to 7th grade, 8th grade, and so forth, and the dots are going to shift around. So the interesting thing here is we're talking about average growth again, which is zero, and down here is achievement. In your reporting, you actually have drop downs where you can change uh, the axes. We can look at the growth versus the economically disadvantaged. 
and the, the, I'm sure you saw all of the schools just scatter and shift around on the screen. This, too, is uh, a place where you can look for, I like to call that actionable nugget of information. If zero represents average growth, this school is making a little better than average growth, this school a little bit uh, less than average growth, and we've got schools represented all across the distribution of, of students who are economically disadvantaged. But the actionable nugget here is what if this school and this school actually met up and partnered for something because they have similar student characteristics. Uh, they have about, I don't know, 64, 65 percent of their kids are economically disadvantaged, and so is this school. But this school is making greater gains with growth than this one. I wonder how the principals or the teachers could partner together to help each other out a little bit. So I like to call these sister schools. And Wendy actually has a story that this actually was beneficial to the high school that she worked in here in North Carolina uh, when she was the, uh, what were you, Wendy? The well, well, I was um, chief academic officer at the time. And uh, we had a high school with, uh, quite frankly, three phenomenal teachers. And uh, they didn't understand why they weren't showing the growth that they wanted to show. And so I was working with them rather closely. I had observed them, and I saw that their students were engaged. Um, we, I had an idea, though, as, as to what it might be. Um, anyone who's ever taught English before knows you kind of have to think about standards-based instruction. And uh, Anyway, um, but I needed some help from another school that was being successful. So we used this uh, district scatter plot to go find a school that had a very similar uh, demographic of students, and you know where our yellow dot was kind of like one of those that uh, Denine was showing you, kind of where her um, arrow is now. That's how low we were with growth, and we found a school uh, that was just that much better um, at the top of that chart. And so we were able to reach out to that principal, and they were only too happy to share. And it turns out they had spent about three or four years working on standards-based instruction, and they even shared with us their pacing guides, and, and we just got a great start from finding that sister school. But I, I love this report for that reason. If you're struggling with a particular subject and maybe that school doesn't have um, anyone who's, who's quite being successful, you can go find someone who has been. It's a really exciting report. Thank you for sharing that story, Wendy. Um, Different states, again, uh, make the scatter plots available uh, publicly. Um, so uh, if you are looking at your particular reports for a single school, you're going to see one dot. A district person would be able to see all of the dots for across the district, uh, which I think is really helpful to maximize the expertise that you have in your district. So that's just a sampling of the reports that you'll see when you go in and actually log into your reporting. But what's coming up uh, here soon is the release of the teacher reports again for the um, district that opted into the data hub. So I need to go out to a different server uh, to actually take you out and give you a, a sneak preview of the teacher report. And we're going to go back to Akita Middle School in Big City School District. And I want to go look at the teacher list by school at Akita Middle School. And I'm going to go down and actually select a teacher. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Marlo Bird. So the reporting, again, if you are an administrator or the individual teacher yourself, the teacher will actually have teacher report and teacher report underneath it, and they will be able to see their only their own report. An administrator will be able to see the entire list of teachers at the school. And then there's something called a teacher summary as well. So for the teacher list and for Big City and Akita, we're going to go back to Marlowe. And this is what the actual teacher report looks like. The navigation within the report is a little bit different. It's tabular navigation. Uh, the teacher value added report here. The teacher diagnostic report is here. And they can also create a custom diagnostic report if they would like. We're going to focus our attention today on the teacher value added and the teacher diagnostic. They'll also see uh, the student list. If you click on this, it would be the students that were used to generate this report for the teachers. 
So the bottom is a table that's going to give you a lot of uh, various uh, calculations. This 1.9 represents the average growth that this teacher made with his or her students um, overall. This was uh, provided to us through the linkage data for the districts that opted in to the data hub. For this average growth measure for this teacher's students, there was a standard error associated with that or a confidence span with this measure. The standard deviation or the population, the entire population of students who took this assessment. An index, an effect size, and a level. We're going to be providing a, with the teacher reports um, a video that actually is going to help explain all of these things. For today, it's just going to be a quick overview. So at the top, we have a lot of the things that you're seeing in the table represented here. The diamond here actually represents that growth measure. When I mouse over it, you're actually going to see that 1.9 that you see in the table. This dotted bar here represents that standard error. This is two standard errors or confidence bands around our growth measure. So this whisker that you see right here actually is crossing the growth standard. But what's most important to note is that the growth measure itself is actually beyond that uh, growth standard. This teacher made better than average progress with his or her students than the growth standard. In order to determine how meaningful the information is that you're seeing, we have to do a little bit of calculations on the report. We want to first of all arrive at an index, a growth measure divided by the standard error will provide us with an index. Any teacher's index that falls between 2 and negative 2 uh, is typically going to fall in the green area or meeting expected growth. However, you also want to do a second layer of investigation to determine how large uh, of a magnitude or how meaningful is this particular uh, growth measure. And in this particular case, Uh, the teacher is doing very well. There will be much more to talk about with these particular reports uh, on the, the recording that you'll see that comes along with the teacher report. I clicked on the teacher diagnostic so you can take a look at that one as well. This report will be available for the teachers, and if you recall the bars going up and down, this will give the teacher an opportunity to look at how they're performing with different achievement groups of students. So these would be students who performed in the lowest third of the state distribution, the highest third of the state distribution, and kids right in the middle. So if I were this teacher, I could potentially write a professional growth goal for myself. I might want to work on learning some differentiated skills to meet the needs of low-achieving students and high-achieving students, because I'm rocking it with my average achieving students. So there's much more to learn about the, the teacher report. Uh, the help will be available, the video will be available, and some other technical documents to help folks with understanding the teacher report. So let me navigate really quickly back to the PowerPoint and go back to uh, our final slides for this time that we're together. And let's make sure I'm sharing and you can see. How are we doing there, Wendy? Can you see? Yep. Okay, great. Let's make sure you still can see. Perfect. So I hope you got a little bit. I know that that was a fast-paced uh, demonstration. Um, remember that you can log in at mi.sas.com. Please don't forget about those resources that are available on the login page. Um, we would like to encourage any districts that have not already opted in to receive teacher reports that you still have a chance to do that for the upcoming year. Uh, what reporting are you going to see? You're going to see your district reporting. It's available automatically at no cost to you. Your school reports are available for you at no cost. Teacher reports also uh, do not have a cost to them, but you must opt in through the data hub in order to receive those teacher reports. And the student projections that we've looked at are available to you at no cost. Uh, to opt in for the teacher reports for the upcoming year of uh, EVOS reporting, you need to click support uh, the michigandatahub.org. So I want to pause for a moment to see if there are any final questions that we need to address. 
or if anyone would like to uh, unmute themselves and chime in. I think Wendy's been answering the questions really effectively on the Q&A chat box. And then finally, I'd like to invite Brian back to talk about the upcoming Educator Workforce Series webinars that you're going to have uh, uh, in upcoming, uh, the upcoming week. Thanks, Anine. Uh, great job, as always. Um, uh, very thorough uh, and uh, good explanations of uh, the complex topic. Uh, just to let everyone know, the next webinar within our series will be on retaining educators through recognition and district culture. That webinar will be on February 22nd at 9 a.m. The registration for that webinar is currently available. Uh, and that registration link uh, is available for you on the screen uh, here. I'll, I'll, we can also put that uh, link in the uh, Q&A as well. Uh, uh, so thanks again so much, everyone. Uh, if you, could, you can continue to use the Q&A to ask questions that you have not yet um, uh, been able to ask, and uh, we will provide responses uh, both uh, within the session and, and after the session as well. Uh, so again, thank you everyone for attending and um, we look forward to uh, interacting with you again at our next uh, webinar session on February 22nd. And uh, thanks again to our partners at uh, SAS and thanks to Neen for your um, uh, very effective presentation. Thank you, Brian. Thanks so much everybody for joining.